Hang on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Wow. Th thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, before I start, I, I really want to thank, uh, I, I, I want to just reiterate to thank the uh, installation crew, Brian and, and Doug and Bruce and Emily. And it was so amazing to work with. Also, Leah, thank you so much for all your work with this. And, and Christina and everybody at the museum. Uh, and Char Charlotte, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, what I'd like to do is sort of, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of uh, using the checklist as a guide. So the, the exhibition, uh, is, you, still, you still make me tremble. Uh, so the, 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 that sort of, one of the, the, the title is a sort of re, retelling of a quote from Ernesto Cardenal. Uh, and and, and, and I, I came across, the, the, the show kind of came together in, in a little bit in fits and starts. We start, the, originally the show was gonna be paired with the uh, outside uh, mural that's in the hallway. Uh, and so that, that mural is called uh, The Wandering Rocks. And, and if you get a chance after the talk to just take a look and you can go through the hallway and see the so amazing uh, photo show in the other gallery. Um, and we started, originally the show was gonna be paired with that. Uh, and then when the, the virus hit, it, it, it got delayed a couple times. And so we decided to move forward with that portion and then have this element of the show a little later. And, and this part ended up shifting quite a bit uh, from the, its original start. Um, I, think, uh, I think to orient you uh, is a good place to start are the three paintings that you see right when you walk in. And uh, there are these sort of, all the, a lot of the word and text things come from I, I kind of snatch them from the air. So as I'm working on drawing, which is, you can see a, a large part of the practice, I'll be, you know, listening to the news or uh, some kind of podcast or interview with someone. And there'll be snippets of things that I, I kind of latch onto and repeat in my head and think about the way the words sound, the rhythms of these things. And the three paintings in the front uh, are, boiled in between, and then it's uh, the remnants of a totalitarian position, and then abstract planes of color are vividly anti-materialistic and powerfully unstable. And I, I thought that that was a, a, an interesting place to start in, in how I sort of frame the show, right? You can sort of, uh, and, and, and these things are from a couple different places. The, the remnants of a totalitarian position is from an essay by Hannah Arendt, and then the abstract planes of color being vividly anti-materialistic is a Wikipedia definition of Russian suprematism. Uh, and, the, and these sort of lines will run through the show. And there's another thing that kind of runs through the show that's a, uh, a quote from, from Nietzsche. And the quote is, a, the quote to me feels almost like an, a set of instructions on, on how to proceed uh, on make, for me to make work. Or, I thought a lot about this quote kind of in the, in the 90s uh, when I was sort of introduced to, to Nietzsche's work through uh, Gilles Deleuze and, and this concept of the eternal return or this sort of things kind of coming back again. And I'll just briefly read the quote and it's, it, there's a drawing of this, this quote. And, and Lee and I, when we were talking about how to frame the show, this came up a lot. There was this question of, of the love letter, right? Of the, the show being a love letter, even with the title, You Still Make Me Tremble, which is, is from a love poem. And, and the you is, of course, not revealed ever. Uh, but then the, the you is a sort of the voice that one has when they're reading the things. But the quote would be, the thrown dice from the number which brings the dice throw back, bringing the dice throw back, the number puts chance back into the fire. It maintains the fire which reheats chance. So it's this sense of trying again and again and, and not being exactly sure what will appear, but then trusting that, that what will appear will then set up a position that you are then able to move forward from. Uh, and I find that a really kind of very hopeful statement, you know, because then there's this, this possibility is always revealing itself. And, the, and then the present is always then, you know, impregnated with that possibility. But uh, there's a few paintings in the back there, and there one is a diptych, and, and it sort of also speaks to sort of how I, I, I will come to stuff. And, 
And it, it's from a, a brief snippet of me calling my sister and interrupting her in the middle of the day to ask her a question and, and thinking that she might be at work. And she says, no, I, I'm not work. I, I'm, I took the day off. And, and, and so there's these sort of different things and snatches of, of life that, that, then, uh, that then guide me as I'm making different drawings, different sort of reenactments of gosh, architecture, uh, the way I'm thinking, uh, how do you even frame a thought or how would you visualize a thought? And, and, and all these different things come to mind. And I guess I can, I can talk also a little bit of how I emerge with the imagery. So I'll take a lot of archival images as I go through things. Uh, the main image here is actually uh, a museum that's, that was called the Government Museum. And this would be in Chennai in India. And the reason I used it as a sort of central piece is that the way that the stairs were laid out reminded me quite a bit of the architecture in this room. There's, as you're sitting in this room, you can see there's lots of reflections. And to me, those reflections, they're almost echoes of, of other moments and as we pass by things. I mean, I can see my reflection in the glass behind me and then reflections of the stairs. And then as we look out into the street, we see reflections of ourselves. And these, these things sort of flitter out like, like echoes of thought to me. And I thought that was a good place to start and ground the show, right? With this sort of entryway to, to a, a government museum in a, in a foreign country. And then interspersed with that are elements of, you know, things from my garage, uh, elements. Uh, I've been living in Kansas City and, you know, where my studio is is a, quite an industrial part of town. And, and, you know, as we go through life, there'll be these surprises. So one of these surprises for me was, was walking down the street and sort of investigating the neighborhood when I first got there. And really, it's freight trains and lots of trucks. And, and you know, it's a pretty desolate spot. But then I came across these two really large uh, sculptures of Horus and Anubis. And I thought, what a, what a thing to find in, 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 in the contemporary world, right? This sort of remnants of the past keep rearing their heads and, and sort of finding ourselves. And some of these abstract kind of, yeah, drawings, uh, you know, uh, their, their, their titles are, I mean, some things become evident, like vase on a shelf or two pots and a dish on, a, on the wonkiest shelf. Uh, there's, another, there's another painting in the back that's sort of a reference to, to a cart and it's all the things on your cart. Um, yeah, a wide nail in a square or a mirror under a shelf with a bottle and a pot, uh, three upside down pots. And some, some of these things are, are quite straightforward. There's a, oh, where is it? There's a small painting that's, that I, I'm referring, that the title I, I, I wrote Gustin-like because it really reminded me of Philip Gustin. It's, it's the one right, right above the, the photographer's head. And uh, the one next to it uh, on the right is, is referred to as now. And then there's other things uh, like plinths and things coming over that are named the next moment. Um, what are some other ones? Uh, there's a few other kind of, as you can see, sort of drawing is a, is a large part of my practice. And, it, and it's a way of sort of exercising moment to moment thoughts as they come in and to see how, how I'm sort of viewing the world and framing it. And, and also to almost plot these internal shifts that might occur. This large wall, right, is called, uh, yeah, the, the large sort of wheat, wheat paste. And this is, this is also uh, the materials that I'm using are, are wheat paste and really uh, sort of Xerox printing paper. Or, you know, and th these are all tiled together, right? So we'll, we'll print them out in about four foot by, I think it's about uh, 55 inch segments or maybe a little less. And then they're, they're sort of simply tiled together. Uh, and then afterwards, they're, they're cut out. So there's discoloration as you put the, the wheat paste is this sort of glue. And that you may have seen it on the street. Uh, people will use it to, to hang, you know, street posters. Um, and I think it's also an element that I, I use those materials because they, they create a kind of element of friction. For me, when I started making work, I, I thought, oh, artwork is this singular thing that creates a masterpiece. And then actually it became really difficult to work that way. And so I thought, well, if things become a little bit more vulnerable, a little bit more based in the moment, a little bit more fugitive, 
then it gives me the opportunity to, to, to work on something and quickly move on. And there's also this, this space too where we're thinking about, well, for me in my training as a, a kind of formal abstractionist, there are these elements of pristine, the, the pristine moment or the pristine sort of element that you put forward. And I think that using some of this, these materials really rubs against that and sort of discards that and sort of, again, throws a wrench into the, into the works. It becomes a kind of, yeah, element that, that, you know, that really describes that these situations are for this moment only and you're here to experience it and it reminds you where you are, you know, where you're standing, where your position is, and also to remind you that that position will shift. And again, back to that initial quote that I referenced. Um, so the, the, the piece behind me is, uh, there's a picture of the Twin Towers in the lobby where they stole the couch. Uh, so this is reference to lobby in my building and, and uh, there was a Sunday and people came down and there was a really nice leather couch there and it was Sunday afternoon and some people came in and they, yeah, we thought they were workmen or replacing the couch, but no, they were, they were, they were taking it. And so they, they took the couch and, and then they put these other chairs in the, in there. And so it's sort of like how the, these, these things are framed and, uh, there's also wheat paste paper, uh, and there's cyanotype on canvas, acrylic on canvas, and acrylic and watercolor on canvas of the paintings. And, and I'll just kind of briefly mention some of the titles from the left to the right. And, uh, and I'll go back and talk a little bit about the cyanotypes, because I think the cyanotypes also reveal something interesting in, the, in, 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 in how the work might be viewed. Um, so the first cyanotype here on to my right, your left, would be down from Union Avenue around 4 uh, p.m. in the fall. Uh, the second one is, is living, or which is actually a reference to a living room. Uh, the third is, is yellow triangles. Uh, the fourth behind me is uh, almost a right angle. And then uh, number five is, is special K. Uh, but I want to just sort of point out the cyanotypes. So the cyanotypes, which is the, I don't know if anyone is familiar, a cyanotype is a kind of uh, cameraless form of photography where you, you put a developing fluid on, on paper or material and then you expose that fluid and you can put things on top of the, the paper or the canvas and uh, put it out into the light and what happens is that then it makes an impression. Whatever is on the, that surface will create a silhouette or you know, the light sort of fixes it to the, the material. And then you, you simply wash out that material and what you're left with are sort of evidence of what was there. So it's a real physical manifestation of what you put on there. In this case, it's broken glass from an abandoned building that's across the street from my studio. So I went out at about 4 p.m. in the afternoon in the fall and then, you know, like, shoveled the broken glass on top of this surface. And, and what it reveals is an incredibly sort of uh, abstract, fractalized view of light and of space and of time. And it, and it describes actually a very specific time and place. Uh, at the same time, it shifts to an incredibly fragmented and abstract view of that same thing. Uh, a little bit like looking through a kaleidoscope where all of a sudden, reality is then turned on its head, which is an interesting thing because also as we see, you know, of course, of course, the cones in our eyes actually view the world upside down and then our minds correct this, right? Uh, our minds correct this and then our, our hearing will then place us in a sense of balance. So all our senses are working at the same time to make sense of how we view the world and how we position ourselves in the world. Always, it's going to be perfect. It's always going to be right. It's always going to be you in that place and looking out into that world. Uh, and I, I find that to be very lovely, right? Because it, it's sort of, there, there's, there's no failure there. There's no mistaking that. It's always how you're seeing the world and it's, it's always correct. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's very particular. So on the other side of the wall, it's a uh, South Indian drawing with views of an abandoned building. And it's... Uh, and it's a, a, a piece of discarded, a doodle really, that was discarded that I found on the street and, and it called attention to itself. And I, and I remember I, I had a photo of it and I thought, oh, I'd love this photo of this man 
that somebody is it, either a portrait or part of an advertisement or just simply a doodle of somebody thinking or being maybe on the phone and talking to someone and they're just sort of making this, this slight drawing as they're, as they're talking. And then uh, again, attached to that wall piece behind me. So, you know, after the, after the talk sort of re resumes, again, I invite you to go to the hallway, but also to tour the exhibition if you haven't already. Uh, there are two cyanotypes there. And then also um, five paintings on the other side of this wall. And then uh, those paintings are, well, the first one is uh, a quote from really wonderful Kink's song called Waterloo Sunset. Uh, I know, Doug, you're familiar with this song. It's a fantastic uh, song by the band The Kinks. And, and one of the lyrics in the song is, every day I look at the, at the world from my window. Uh, the next quote comes from really uh, this, this past summer when there was the assassination of the Haitian president. Uh, there's a, a Haitian quote, which is behind the mountains, more mountains. Uh, and, and meaning that after you do the thing that is so difficult, there's more difficulties in front of you. Uh, but again, back to this original quote from Nietzsche, which is the space where you're rolling the dice and you're going through that. And, and, and that's a hopeful thing. And it's a way that, you know, I think in my, every time we, we have these obstacles, we go through them. And, you know, we might be afraid of them or they make us anxious, but we go through them anyway. And I think that's an incredible source of strength for all of us, right? The, that we're able to then survive through these things. And, and there'll be more, but then we learn from them and we, we really can just sort of be in life in that moment. Uh, the next painting behind, behind that is uh, pure elements of libidinal investment. Um, and then finally, there's a, a well, not finally, there's, there's, there's actually two more. Uh, um, one is a, a quote that I, I remember we were walking outside of our apartment building and there are these, these people that were going to be in a, a, a party. It was like a wedding party and it was the, the guests from the w wedding party and they're talking and as we're walking down the street, we catch a little bit of this uh, of sni snippet of conversation where the, the three women are talking among themselves like, what are we going to do tonight? And one mentions, well, we've got several different drugs in the room. And I thought that was like really funny, like some kind of invitation. And then finally, in the, the last uh, painting is, is Sake de Meta. Sake de Meta is a uh, goal kick. And it's something that was coming up uh, this summer. There was the European finals and also the, the Copa America, which is a football tournament. And, and I remember my mother on the phone sort of saying these words, Sake de Meta, Sake de Meta. And she'd be like, I love when they say that. I love when they, the announcer says, it's a goal kick. And I was thinking just, I, 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 and I, the way I understood that is the sort of rhythm of the words, the, 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 the S and the A rolling off your tongue and then interrupted by the sharp Q sound, by the K sound, and then back to the M sound, and then finally with a T and an A. Uh, yeah, and so there's all of these sort of different kind of moments of, as I go through the world that will start to appear. Um, on the right is a pretty large-scale photo mural, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit. It's uh, my, my cousin's daughter and her friend having graduated from med school in Buenos Aires. And, and the idea is that once you graduate from med school, once you've done all your exams and you've gone through the gauntlet, as it were, this really difficult thing, all your friends, they'll come and they'll spray silly spray on you, smoke bombs, and like kind of cut up your clothes a little bit and, and, and they like throw things at you. And it's like a little bit of a party and a, a bit of a celebration. Um, and I remember that moment just sort of, oh gosh, I, I really wanted to make this event. I was a little bit late. Uh, and and, and I, I remember stumbling upon it and everyone is so excited. And the, these two really young, young doctors that are going to go out into the world, having finished the very first part of their, their training and then sort of you know, really reveling in that moment, in that precise moment, surrounded by the people that they love and being able to be celebrated by their friends. I, I found that so incredibly lovely. Um, again, sort of mentioning drawings. One of the things that uh, I, I really want to thank Leah Kolb again for, for her participation in making this show. Uh, one thing that was really wonderful is uh, I was really nervous about doing the show as I was going through it. And and I was working frantically, like every day, sort of accumulating this work. And I, I don't think I realized how much work I had done. And, 
And I had given Leah part of the work uh, early in September, and then uh, I, I showed up with more work when I came back in, in November to set up a show. And they had laid out all the drawings and all the paintings I had done on the floor, and they fit basically like I would say about half of this room, all laid out on the floor, all of these drawings like this. And so it was this amalgamation of language, uh, also strictly black and red uh, and white. And I, I just wanted to mention a couple of the, go through a couple of the things, uh, drawings that are on the wall behind me. And so there's 21 drawings behind me. And these are, again, sort of these things that you are very familiar and that almost evoke a sound, so the first one being guitars and drums, which you know you can almost hear the remnants of this wonderful band that we just had playing, uh, again, echoing through us. There's also elements uh, from a kind of political element, so uh, Man of Steel, uh, yeah, what is it, Man of Steel? I can't rate it, but I think, uh, yeah, Convicted of Graft, uh, elements about the governor that was then uh, governor of Illinois, uh, uh, Blagdanovich, I think that was his name, and, and sort of, you know, then pardoned by uh, our last president, 45, and, you know, is, that one is titled Government Shakedown. There's elements about, uh, one of them is, again, sort of, you know, snippets of somebody else's conversation or, or the question being asked, did we finish off the entire gallon of the box of wine? Uh, and then sort of, you know, put up with the story about Penelope Spears. Penelope Spears is a film director and one of her first uh, jobs out of grad school was editing film for Richard Pryor. There was a film that Richard Pryor was working on that never got released. And, and there's this kind of wonderful story about, you know, that, that Penelope Spears relates uh, about Richard Pryor. And, and I, I mention that because the way I get to these moments are very circuitous. You know, I was thinking about Penelope Spears as the director of films like uh, decline of Western civilization, and then later they, they were hired to direct Wayne's World. Uh, but it was a, a person that it would have been really, really difficult for them to be in this male-dominated film industry at the time. And ultimately, I think they got fed up with having to always, you know, account for their own strength. Uh, but also then making these films and, and coming to the sort of owning her own spear. And, and, and she des describes the story about Richard Pryor, which for me is a really important figure in, in sort of American history uh, or an American sort of entertainer and, and also very distinct. And particular thing about Richard Pryor is that they're working in the 1970s and there's moments in the mid 1970s, late 1970s that are really evocative of moments that we're living in today, I think. Um, and, and the story is that Penelope Spears is working on this film and the doorbell rings and there's an IRS uh, guy at the door and apparently Richard, this would have been in the late 70s and Richard Pryor hadn't paid any of his taxes since 1966 and so they were coming to collect and Penelope Spears tells the, the IRS guy to hold on a second, she's going to see, she doesn't think Richard is home but she's going to take a look and so they, you know, she goes down and, and Richard Pryor says, no, tell him I'm not here. And she goes back, answers the door, and she's explaining to the guy that Richard Pryor isn't, isn't, isn't there, that he's gone on a trip. Meanwhile, Richard Pryor goes around the house, he gets some gardening sh uh, shears, and goes up next to the IRS guy and starts cutting the hedge, you know, kind of trying to mess with him, sort of saying like, you know, I'm just the gardener, sir, you know. Uh, I, and I just thought that was a particularly, also like a very personal story, like a, like, exhibition of a particular moment in time that then, uh, and, and then I sort of looked at that, can I stretch that? Can I take history and then almost rub up against it in some way? I'm so beside myself, all the folks that came out and all the people have been just supporting me and, and so generous with me just through the years. I'm really so yeah, touched by that. Thank you.